Well, hey, welcome everybody. Good to see you guys. I want to welcome everybody at all of our locations and all of you who are watching online. Thanks for being with us today. We are continuing in a series called Game Changers. And here's what we're doing. We're looking at some people in Scripture that uh, we actually don't know a lot about them. There's not a lot of details there, but their impact was massive. They were, they were game changers. Before we dive in, just want to remind everybody that next weekend, uh, we're going to continue the series Game Changers, but next weekend we're also going to celebrate baptisms. And if you have said yes to Jesus, then uh, next weekend we want to encourage you to follow Jesus in being baptized. Uh, baptism is a public profession of your personal decision to, to follow Jesus. And so you can sign up today at all of our locations right after the service uh, in the lobby. Just go to Next Steps. You can sign up there. Now, uh, anytime we have baptisms, I usually have friends, people in the church, people who are new ask me, hey, Chad, I was baptized as, as an infant, so I'm good, right? And I'll have a conversation that goes like this. Uh, here at Sun Valley, if you're new, we actually don't do infant baptism here. And this is why. Uh, here at Sun Valley, we're a Bible church. And we just go with what the Bible says. And you will not find infant baptism in the scriptures. In the Bible, baptism always happens after somebody personally decides to become a Jesus follower. Okay, And so if you were baptized as an infant, uh, that was a very special moment. Don't want to take anything away from that. That was a holy moment uh, for your parents. Right? Uh, in essence, that was them dedicating you to the Lord. We do that here at Sun Valley where you can come and take your child and we'll pray over them. But in the scriptures, baptism always comes after a person's personal decision to follow Jesus. So you didn't choose that baptism, right? That was your parents saying, we're going to raise them in the Lord. If you have since given your life to Jesus, then baptism is you in your own decision, right? Saying, I'm a Jesus follower. And so if that's you, again, would love to celebrate baptism with you next weekend. If you're a teenager or child has said yes to Jesus, you can sign them up to be baptized as well. And we're going to have a great time celebrating together. So game changers, looking at people in the Bible who we don't know a lot about necessarily, but they had massive impact. And today we're going to look at the life of Stephen. All locations, how many of you have heard of Stephen? Just a show of hands. Yeah, a lot of us. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the passages of scripture where Stephen is stoned with rocks. <laughs> Not with weed. For all of you who are new to the Bible and from Colorado, okay? So... <laughs> Or California or Nevada or Washington State or wherever else that, that is happening, okay? Uh, Stephen is, is killed with rocks, all right? He, he, was, he was stoned, that's what that is. And he's actually the, the first martyr uh, of the New Testament church. Let me give you a little Bible history here, all right? Kind of bring you up to speed. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts. If you brought your Bible, you can turn there. We're going to look at some verses of scripture in Acts chapters 6, 7, and 8 as we look at what happened with Stephen. But, but here's what happens in the scriptures, a little, little Bible history. Here's, here's what took place. So Jesus uh, ministered for three years. He died on the cross and he rose again. Uh, the Bible says that after he rose again, so this is the resurrected Christ, uh, for 40 days he appeared to his followers. Now think about that for a second. So for 40 days, not just the 12, but over 200 people saw the resurrected Christ. Let me give you a little Bible bonus. If you're new to church, maybe kind of in the process, figuring out what, what you believe. Um, James, who actually wrote a book in the Bible, was Jesus's half-brother, because Jesus, God, was his father. Make sense? All right. But Mary and Joseph had other children. One of those children was James. James came to faith in Jesus during that 40 days, because he saw the resurrected Christ. Now, think about that for a second. All right. What would you have to do to convince your brother that you're the son of God? <laughs> right. So James wasn't a believer until after the resurrection. That just is one of the many reasons why I believe the Bible. And so Jesus appeared to his followers for 40 days. Uh, and then he's standing on a hillside. He says, all right, here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to go and I want you to make followers of me. I want you to make disciples. Okay. And then he says, and then I want you to baptize them. We're celebrating baptisms next weekend. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That comes after a person becomes a disciple, right? A follower of Jesus. So he says, I want you to make followers of me. 
And when they say yes to me, when they meet me, right, I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I want you to teach them everything that I've taught you. And I, I want you to do that like here and there and all over the world. And I'll be with you till the end of the age. And then the Bible says that Jesus literally right there does a Peter Pan, okay? He ascends into heaven. They literally watch him go up until he's gone. And then they're all standing around looking at each other. And they kind of like, well, maybe we should pray, right? And so they go and they, they have a prayer meeting. And some days later on the day of Pentecost, all right, so 50 days after the Passover, 50 days after Jesus is crucified, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit shows up, empowers them in supernatural ways. Uh, different things are happening. People are realizing that this is a powerful miracle moment. Uh, Peter's there in the city. People are saying different things about these Jesus followers. There's something supernatural happening. They're acting kind of weird. Are they drunk? What's going on? Peter sees it as a teaching opportunity, he stands up, he preaches. And he like lays it down and he says, by the way, uh, Jesus who you crucified, that was the Messiah, right? And he rose again, you probably want to put your faith in him. And in that moment, 3,000 people respond. And the New Testament church is, is born. Church, right now, uh, if you're here at one of our locations, right, right now we're experiencing church, but the Bible teaches the church is not a building that you come and sit in. It's a movement that you choose to be part of to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. 3,000 people that day, you can read about this in Acts chapter 2, say yes to Jesus, and they all become part of this movement to help other people say yes to Jesus. So baptisms are happening, and the apostles, an apostle, by the way, if you've ever heard that, uh, an apostle is just somebody that had face time with Jesus. That's, that's the 12. There were 12, and then Judas betrayed Jesus. Does this sound familiar to anybody? All right. And they said, okay, well, let's, let's replace him, because Jesus started with 12, and so they, they picked a guy named Matt. All right, that's the English way we would say it. And Matt kind of takes Judas' spot. So there's 12 apostles. They all had face time with Jesus. And they're leading the church. And different things are happening when you read through the book of Acts. And then 5,000 more people say yes to Jesus. So now you got 8,000 believers in Jerusalem. And this thing is just rolling. And the apostles are getting worn out because they're trying to minister to 8,000 people. I mean, the first church is a big church. Is everybody with me? It's multi-site. They kind of met everywhere. And so the leaders are teaching. They are feeding the poor. They're caring for people. And the pastors, the lead pastors of the church, the apostles are getting worn out. And they're like, okay, here's, here's what we got to do. Uh, we got to get some help. Because there's these widows and they're not being fed and they're supposed to be fed. And so we just need, we, we need some help. And so they decided they would pick some other leaders in the church. And these people wouldn't necessarily teach like when they had the big teaching times. Uh, but these leaders uh, would serve and care for the community. So in this moment, it starts to roll out how the church works. Because the church is not a building you come and sit in. It's a movement you choose to be part of to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. And here's the reality. If you're a Jesus follower, you don't come to church you are the church. In fact, would you just turn to somebody next to you and would you just go, hey, you're the church. One, two, three, go. Yeah, and so just so you know, right, because you're the church, if you're a Jesus follower, if you ever come to me and you say, hey, why didn't the church do this? I'm gonna say, I don't know, why don't you? Right? Because you're the church. Why doesn't the church do this? I don't know. Go ahead. Why, why don't you if you feel like you ought to be doing that? Because you are the church. And so they start to kind of break up the ministry and all the people begin to minister to each other and they add these other leaders. So the lead pastors are getting worn out. The church is booming. Thousands of people are saying yes to Jesus. Thousands of people are being baptized. God is on the move. Some of the people aren't being served. The lead pastors need some help. Here's what happens. Pick up with me here, Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. There's so much work to be done. What are we going to do? We need some help. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute. So seven guys are going to join the apostles in the ministry. But these seven are not going to be preaching and teaching these seven are going to be serving and caring for the people who are saying yes to Jesus. They're going to be shepherding, pastoring, right? Caring for people, serving. Seven men of good repute that are full of the Holy Spirit. Anytime in the Bible when you see the capital S, that's talking about the Holy Spirit. Full of the Spirit and of wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty. They're going to serve, care for the poor, care for the widows, 
care for the people. Verse 4. But we, these are the lead pastors talking, right? The apostles. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, which, by the way, has never happened in church since that moment. <laughs> the whole gathering was fine, okay? We'll talk more about that in a minute. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen. Here he is. A man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. The other six are mentioned there when you, when you read the passage of Scripture. Verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So here's what you've got. Jesus stands on the mountain, right? He says, okay, go and make followers of me. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them everything I've taught you. I'll be with you to the end of the age. He ascends into heaven. Ten days later, Holy Spirit comes upon him. Like miracles are happening, Peter stands up, preaches, New Testament church is born, the thing starts to explode. Lots of people are saying yes to Jesus. The apostles are overworked. We need some help. They get seven other guys to help. The church is ministering to each other. God is on the move. Amazing things are happening. At this time, the world had never seen anything like this. And they didn't know what to call it. And in fact, in, in Greek, the, the word church uh, literally means a group of people joined together, called out for a common purpose and a common cause. In the New Testament, the word church doesn't mean building. It means people joined together, called out for a common purpose and a common cause. And the common purpose and common cause in the New Testament here was to help people meet, know, and and follow Jesus. We are the church. If you've said yes to Jesus, you are the church. We gather together in a building. We meet together in a building. We learn together in a building. But everywhere you go, the church is there because, because you are there. The church is us. Me and you. Called out together for a common purpose to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. We're all in this together, and we all have different roles. I want to celebrate some people uh, in our church who don't just come to church. They are being the church. Uh, they serve in our guest services. And I can't celebrate everybody who serves in our guest services because that would take all weekend just to read all the names. There are hundreds and hundreds. But I just want to celebrate three people here. Uh, this is Rachel. She serves over at our Queen Creek location. She's actually been serving in guest services for uh, five years and she's been at Queen Creek, because that's a new campus, uh, for the past 18 months or so. And so thank you, Rachel, for the way that you are the church. I want to celebrate Jonathan. He attends our Gilbert campus. He's been serving in our coffee shop for the past year. He's part of the team as a volunteer. And I want to thank Jonathan for the way that he is the church. This is Bethany, and she serves uh, over at our Tempe location. She's there with her husband, Lance. Uh, Bethany um, is a rock star, and she serves uh, not just, honestly, at our Tempe location. I've seen her at other locations as well, and guest services, and she's an usher and a greeter and all of that. These are three people, all right, amongst hundreds who at Sun Valley, they don't just come to church, they are the church. In fact, I want to ask uh, everybody right now, all locations, how many of you serve in our guest services ministry? Just to show of hands. Yep, all over the room. Can we take a moment and just thank these people for their service? You are called to be part of this thing, uh, not just to sit and to soak, but to give and to serve. It's part of what it means to follow Jesus. You don't come to church. You are the church. And so you think to yourself, okay, all right, so I'm supposed to serve. I know I'm supposed to serve God. How do I serve God? Here's how you serve God. You ready? You serve God by serving people. How do you serve God? You serve God by serving people. I'm going to say it again. You serve God by serving, fill in the blank, people. Which means if you're not serving anybody, if you're not serving people, then you're not serving God. To serve God is to serve people. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, okay, I'll just sum it all up, right? All of the law, all the prophets hang on these two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. See how those two things are connected? You love God by loving people. You serve God by serving people. You can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. Giving and serving is what love looks like when it's, when it's happening. 
And so Stephen becomes one of these leaders who will serve and care for the, for the people. He's, he's, he's not preaching and teaching necessarily, but he's, he's caring for those in need. He's just serving God by serving people. This is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what it means to love. Here's what happens with Stephen. Acts chapter 6, verse 9. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue rose up and disputed with Stephen. Okay, here's what's happening. So they haven't built church buildings yet, so they're just meeting in the buildings that are already there. They're meeting in the Jewish synagogues. And so here's what you have. You have these Jews who've put their faith in Jesus, and you have uh, these Greeks who've put their faith in Jesus. So you had really religious people and really irreligious people getting together now to worship Jesus. And so they're meeting in the synagogues and then sometimes the synagogue leaders would like, no, you can't meet here. So then they would meet in homes and they would meet in courts and they would meet in open spaces. And so Stephen's in the midst of all this. He's caring for people. He's leading people. God is using him. And some of those synagogue leaders don't like Stephen. And one of the reasons they don't like Stephen is because everybody likes Stephen. You with me? And so some of those synagogue leaders are losing their influence and Stephen is gaining influence. And so they start to argue with Stephen and they start to become a problem for Stephen. Verse 10, look at this. So they begin to argue with him. They begin to call him out. Stephen's serving and all this and how do you have the authority and all that's happening. They're challenging Stephen. Verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen was speaking. It was like every time Stephen would speak, every time he would be challenged in the midst of serving, it was like God was speaking through him. And they couldn't argue with him. Verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men. Another word for instigated in the original language is bribed. They paid people to start speaking poorly and telling lies about Stephen. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard Stephen, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses. And against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon Stephen and they seized him and they brought him before the council. What's the council? The same guys who are in leadership that work behind the scenes to get Jesus, humanly speaking, put on the cross. Verse 13. And they set up false witnesses who said this against Stephen. This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law of God. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, meaning the temple, right, the whole Jewish system, and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. So here's what we've got, right? Stephen's growing in influence. How's he doing that? Just through loving people well. Just through serving. Think about this for a second. If you've got people in your life that you want to influence for Jesus and you're sitting around working on a speech, right? Of how you're going to debate them and just get it right. Can I just help you? Just get rid of the speech and start to serve. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so Stephen is gaining an authority and influence just because he's loving people well, because he's serving people well. Now, when he was challenged, God just kind of took over and, and, and spoke through him, and these people are getting sick of it. So what they do is they hire some people to tell lies about Stephen. They say he's blaspheming, you know, against God and against Moses, and if you're Jewish, he's speaking out against that. By the way, Stephen was Jewish. He just happened to speak Greek. When you do a little study there, you can find that. So he's a Jewish person who gave his life to Jesus, believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They tell lies about him. He's blasphemous, all this kind of stuff. Here's what happens, Acts chapter 7. He's before this council, and they're speaking out against him. And yet they notice this, and this is, this is an odd thing. In fact, um, I was speaking at a Christian camp this past week, and I was with the president of an organization called Walk Through the Bible. He has like a PhD in theology. And so I'm looking at this passage of Scripture, and in this passage of Scripture, right, they're bringing these accusations against Stephen. And in Acts chapter 7, it says, all of them can't take their eyes off of Stephen because he has the face of an angel. And so I went to the president of Walk Through the Bible with a PhD, right, in theology. And I said, hey, doctor, his name's Phil, so I called him Dr. Phil all week. It was great, <laughs> right? I said, hey, Dr. Phil, tell me about the face of an angel. What does that mean? And he looked all studious and he thought for a second. 
He looked at me and he said, in lots of wisdom, you know, I'm like, here it comes, right? He looked at me, he said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, well, a lot of good that PhD did you, huh? Right? Uh, the idea here is, is he was just at peace. He was just a person of peace. He was just so, catch this now, even brought before the court, right? He's just so secure in who he was in Jesus. We sang about it a, a, a moment ago. You know, I am a child of God. That's who I am. And in that, there's this freedom. And, and Stephen is just at peace. And he's so much at peace, right? The face of an angel. They just can't take their eyes off of him. So finally, they give him a chance to speak. And he does. And if you read Acts chapter 7, here's what you've got. You've got the cliff notes of the Old Testament in Acts chapter 7. The Jewish faith. Stephen just breaks it down, just kind of compresses it. This happened and then this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. And in essence, he's saying, I don't have a problem with the law. I don't have a problem with Moses. I don't have a problem with the Jewish system. And you're reading through this and you're thinking if you're there in the court, right, you're going, okay, maybe this guy's good. But then he wraps it up this way. And I'm going to put it in modern vernacular. Stephen looks at this group and in essence says, here's what I have a problem with. All those Old Testament scriptures that prophesied about the Messiah, Jesus was him. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the anointed one, the promised one. And you goofballs crucified him. And in essence, he says, you need to repent. You crucified the Messiah. God's plan's been unfolding through the centuries. It was right before you, and you blew it. And in this moment, when Stephen says this, they start freaking out. Like the crowd goes wild. Like a riot starts to happen. And they drag him out of the city. And they start to kill him. Look at this. Acts chapter 7 verse 58. It says, then they cast him out of the city. And here it is. And they stoned him. Which means they threw rocks at him until he was dead. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And as they were stoning Stephen, killing him with rocks, rocks are hitting his body, his head, his face. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, look at this, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice and he says the same thing at least principally, that Jesus said on the cross. He said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which means he died. Saul, one of the reasons, there's lots of reasons why I believe the Bible's true. One of the reasons, one of the other reasons, I mentioned one earlier, of why I believe the Bible is true is because of what happened in Saul's life. You keep reading through the book of Acts, Saul is persecuting the Christians, the Jesus followers. We're going to read this in a minute. He's going from house to house, and he's dragging people out, and he's killing them, having them killed. But Saul is on the road to Damascus to kill more Christians, and he has a supernatural encounter with Jesus. This man, Saul, would become the Apostle Paul, who wrote... Most of your New Testament. Which means the Christian killer became a Christian. Might be something to that. And here he is woven into the story at the execution, right? The murder of Stephen over his, his faith in, in Christ. You know, you read this and you think, what a tragedy. Right? But God did some amazing, powerful, beautiful, wonderful things in and through this event. To the extent that God took this event, what happened with Stephen, and in that the whole thing began to change. And it rippled out from this moment through the centuries all the way to us here and now this weekend. It looks horrible, right? But God was actually doing something beautiful.
Everybody got some notes when you came in today. I'm going to invite you, if you would, to take those out. If you're new, they're in the program that you got. When you came in, you can also take notes on the Sun Valley app. Three game-changing lessons here from the life of Stephen. And I want to show you some of the beauty that's here, that if you're not paying attention, you just might, you just might, you just might miss it. Um, some lessons, and then I'll show you the beautiful part here in just a second. Some lessons. Number one, game-changing lessons. Um, you and I have to wrap our mind around this. Faithfulness to God does not guarantee the absence of problems. Faithfulness to God does not guarantee the absence of problems. Now, I know that when you turn on late-night TV, right, there are preachers on there that will tell you that when you say yes to Jesus, your life will be problem-free. Everybody look at me. That is not true. No matter how much money you send those guys. Jesus said, and I'll quote him, in this world... You will have trouble. <laughs> Faithfulness to God does not guarantee the absence of problems. Next to that in your notes, write this. Write, but it will bring you peace. Would you write that down in your notes? Faithfulness is not going to keep you from having problems, but you will find peace in the midst of your problems. If you're having these moments where like you're driving down the road and you have a flat tire and you're like, God, are you kidding me? I went to church three weeks in a row. <laughs> right? That's the wrong kind of thinking. Okay? Everybody, all locations, this is important because we, we believe some wrong things about God and about the Christian faith. Uh, you live in a broken world. Have you noticed? Uh, the weather is broken. It's July in Arizona, right? I was driving back from Southern California Friday afternoon. I got out to put gas in my car in Quartzsite, Arizona. And I thought, welcome home, right? It's hot. The weather's broken. Has anybody noticed? Right? Government, the worldly authorities, politics, are broken. Have you noticed that one? My body is broken. Now, I'm trying to take care of it and eat right and exercise a little bit, but I'll just help you. The longer you watch me, the more downhill you're going to see me go, okay? <laughs> it, it, it is all downhill from here. My, my body is broken. And if I'm really, really honest, I'm broken. Man, I don't get everything right. If you're like, oh, man, I want my pastor to be perfect, you're at the wrong church. You're like, what? I want the perfect church. You have not found it. We don't have perfect leaders here, perfect pastors, and I'll help you. We don't have perfect people. And if you find a church that's perfect, don't go there because you will screw it up. <laughs> all right? We're all broken, and we're all a work in progress, and we all need Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right? We live in a broken world. There's going to be problems. I love you. There's going to be problems. There's going to be pain. Here's what I've learned in life. One of the secrets of happiness is this. You ready? It's low expectations. <laughs> we were on vacation because I've, I've been on sabbatical. I came back last weekend. If you weren't here, I was gone for a couple of months and thanked everybody last weekend. You can go online and hear some of that if, if, if you want. But we were on vacation and uh, my wife and I actually got to go to Italy, which, which was great, right? <laughs> And we'd be talking about what we were going to do the next day. And she's like, this is going to be fantastic. This is going to be amazing. And I'd be like, oh, I'll probably be okay. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, secret of happiness. <laughs> Low expectations, right? <laughs> uh, but we had, a, we had a great time together. So, so here's the question, right? If, if serving God, if being faithful is not going to solve all my problems, then why should I do it? If God's not going to protect me, right? from all pain and problems if I serve him, then why should I serve him? Here's why. Just, just a few thoughts. Uh, one, because he served you and he loves you. When you realize God's love for you, I'm just going to make you this promise. When you realize God's love for you, you will love him in return. And you will serve him in return. If you're like, I just don't want to serve God you don't get his love yet. Our problem is not that we don't love God enough. Our problem is we do not realize how much he loves us. When you understand the love of God, you will respond. 
And so if you're like unmotivated or whatever, here, here would be your prayer. God, help me understand your love for me so that I might trust you. So that's a thought. Here's another one. Here's why you want to serve. Because that's what you were created to do. Your soul will find satisfaction through service. I mean, this is, this is the thing that stands out to me in this passage of Scripture. Stephen is being martyred, and he's at peace. Stephen is being put on trial, and he's at peace. The Bible says he's got the face of an angel. And in the midst of this massive problem, this man of God, Stephen, who serves, is at peace. Why? Because his life's not about him. Jesus said this, to find your life, you must lose it. To live, you first must die. Here's what he's saying. What's he saying? Here's what he's saying. You don't really start to live until you start living for something bigger than you. There's a peace that comes with that, even in the midst of a broken world. Right now, I wrote this down. You might be thinking, man, I'm so bored and unfulfilled. Start serving. Here's what I wrote down. You might be bored and unfulfilled because you're unwilling to get uncomfortable and serve Jesus. Um, I'll just say this. Your soul will never be satisfied sitting around eating pizza and watching Netflix. It's just not going to happen. There's something about generosity. There's something about giving and serving that satisfies the soul. I mean, think about this. All of life works that way. What makes life possible is giving and serving. I do this every once in a while. I'm going to do it quickly right now on a macro level. The planets and the sun, they're all giving and serving one another. It's what makes the solar system work. If they don't give and serve, it doesn't work. They're sharing gravity. The sun is sharing heat, right? Light, uh, energy. The moon dances with the earth in giving and serving. And as a result, we have the, we have the tides. It's what makes life, life possible. Right now, that's macro, micro. Protons, neutrons, electrons are all giving and serving one another. It's what makes life possible, right? They're bouncing off one another. It's what makes the system work. And you're like, Mother Nature? No, Father God. All of that is a reflection of this connection of the very essence of who God is. God is not one, he's three. God is not three, he's one. One divine essence, three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And they all give and serve one another. They all glorify one another. All of creation is a reflection of that giving and, and serving. I know that's a big thought, but just chew on that. Which is why the more selfish you are, the more miserable you will be. Here's why. You are bumping up against ultimate reality. If you are self-absorbed, self-centered, you want everything to revolve around you. You don't want to enter the dance of giving and serving. You are bumping up against ultimate reality and your soul is shrinking through being self-centered and through being selfish. One of the greatest antidepressants in the world is serving somebody else. It's the way God made us. Your soul was created to give and serve. And here we have Stephen in the midst of this huge problem and his soul is at peace. Number two, game-changing lessons. Number two, faithfulness to God often comes with criticism. Faithfulness to God often comes with criticism, which begs the question, then why do I want to be faithful? Here's why, because he's God. Everybody look at me here for a second. Let me just rock your world. Okay, I'm going to tell you this truth. It's a truth we say all the time at Sun Valley, and then I'm going to add something to it. You ready? God loves you. He does. No matter where you've been, what you've done, or what's been done to you, God loves you. But here it is. But it's not all about you. God loves you, but he's God. And you're not. Why would I want to be faithful and serve him if I'm going to get criticized? Here's why. Because he's God. And it will fulfill the deepest longings of your soul. I wrote a few thoughts here. If you're not ready to be criticized for obeying God, then you might not be ready to be used by God. That's just going to come with the territory. If you're taking notes, write this one down. Here's how to avoid criticism. You ready? Here's how to avoid criticism in your life. Do nothing, believe nothing, and stand for nothing. Da-da! You want to avoid criticism? Do nothing, believe nothing, and stand for nothing. Otherwise, you're going to be criticized. Here's what I've learned in life, all right? If you're like leading 10 people, you got one critic. It's usually about 10%. If you're leading 100, 
right? You got 10 critics. You're leading 1,000, you got 100, right? If there's 8,000 people here this weekend, 800 people aren't going to like half of what I said today. It's just how it is. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. You ready? Just embrace that. Criticism just comes with it. But you want to be criticized like Stephen? Listen, for doing good. Be criticized for doing good. You're going to be criticized anyway. Let it be for doing good. Does this make sense? I remember this moment, and a lot of times I don't like to be around other pastors because when a group of pastors get together, you know what they get when they get together? Here's what they get when they get together. They get critical, right? <laughs> and so they're talking about different things, and I was actually walking by, and this one pastor didn't know that I was walking by at that moment. And he was talking about our church, Sun Valley Community Church, and he called us Sin Valley Community Church. And the reason he called us Sin Valley, you don't like that, do you? The reason he called us... <laughs> Sin Valley is because we had a lady uh, give her testimony in our church, and she used to be an exotic dancer, and she, she you know, talked about that. And I came out of this, and I gave my life to Jesus. God has radically changed my life. And this person was there that Sunday, and he didn't like the fact that you know, she talked about her sin, and then she talked about how God changed her life. And he you know, said, Sin Valley. And then he kind of turned, and he saw me. And I said, what? I said, did you just call us Sin Valley? You know, he's kind of looked down, and I walked around and I hugged him. I said, thank you, man. Thank you. And then I stepped back. I said, because, you know, Jesus was a friend of sinners. And when somebody said that, they weren't complimenting him. And then I said, aren't you glad Jesus is a friend of sinners? Because otherwise you wouldn't be saved. <laughs> right? And then I thought, punk. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. No, I said, aren't you glad Jesus is a friend of sinners? Otherwise, we wouldn't get to know him and we wouldn't be saved. And I just kind of went on, right? <laughs> Criticism just comes with the territory. Be okay with that. But be criticized for doing good. Last one, number three. Faithfulness to God fulfills God's purposes. That's why you want to be faithful. Because it fulfills God's purposes. And God's purposes are beautiful. Even if they don't look like it at the time, something bigger is, is going on. So Jesus tells his disciples, hey, you know, go to all the world and share the gospel. And here's what they did. They all went home and they shared the gospel. And nobody went anywhere. They all stayed in Jerusalem until Stephen was martyred. Look at this. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. It says in Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul, that's part of it too. That's something beautiful. I mean, most of the New Testament written by this guy. And Saul approved of Stephen's execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Look at this. And what happened? They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the original 11, right, and the one they added, Matt, except the Apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church, that guy who would become the Apostle Paul, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Look at this, verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. They started to fulfill the Great Commission. They left Jerusalem. Why? Because it was hard there. And everywhere they moved, they preached. Let me show you this little bitty bit, and I want to wake one big point as we wrap up and then I'll pray for you. Look at this. Acts chapter 7 verses 54 through 56. It's when Stephen was being executed. God's fulfilling his purposes. They're going to move out. Saul is going to become the apostle Paul. God's going to do this beautiful thing in and through this huge problem of Stephen's. Look at this, Acts chapter 7, verse 54. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged. This is when they're all getting mad. Stephen's like, you crucified the Messiah, you dummies. They were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, look at this, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus, what's the next word? What is it? That's really important. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man, next word, standing at the right hand of God. Literally, as Stephen is dying, God in his grace kind of peels back the divide between this dimension and that one. And Stephen can see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. 
Now, here's the thing. Everywhere else in the Bible, Jesus, after the resurrection, is seated at the right hand of God. But here in this moment, he's what? He's what? Say it with me. He's standing at the right hand of God. Why? Why? Here's why I believe Stephen looks up, you know. God kind of peels back the divide. He sees Jesus there, and Jesus stands up from being seated at the right hand of God, and he looks at Stephen and his faithfulness, and Jesus says, And he's welcoming him home. He's welcoming him home. Here's the big thought. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. A lot of Bible today, a lot of history. Remember this. Here it is for your life. Prefer the applause of heaven over the opinions of men. Look at me. Live for what matters most. And you'll have peace in the problems. And you'll have peace forevermore. Let me take a second and pray for you. Would you pray with me? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want to challenge you. Any area of your life where there's chaos. Where there's a lack of peace. I'll make you a promise, there's selfishness. And if that's on you, I want to encourage you to own it. And repent. And be faithful to whatever it would mean in that situation to give and to serve. If you're on the sidelines, you come to church, you sit and soak, but you don't serve, I want to encourage you to get off the sidelines and get in the game. And be faithful. To whatever God asks you to do. And I want to just tell you, God loves you. God cares for you. He is for you. But it's not all about you. And you will not find peace until you begin to follow him through giving and serving. And he wants that for you. So trust him. Father, give us wisdom of these things and teach us. Our problem is not that we don't love you enough. Our problem is we do not understand your love for us because if we understood your love for us, then we would always do what you say. And so teach us, we pray. Help us to know your love so that we might trust you. Jesus, Stephen is not the hero of this story. You are. Thank you. We choose to trust you. And in that, we give and serve. In your great name, we pray, Jesus. Amen.